but it's their Jeet Kune Do. It's their own interpretation of that art, but it's not Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. Hey there, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 406. Today, my guest is Sifu Abe Santos. My name is Jeremy. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I love martial arts. I love all kinds of martial arts, specifically traditional martial arts, and that's what we get to on this show. We talk about traditional martial arts, karate and kung fu and taekwondo and Filipino martial arts and historical European martial arts and capoeira and so many others. In fact, if I was to make a list, that would be a very long intro, and I'd still find a way to leave something out and I would offend someone. So if I didn't mention your art, please don't get hurt. I just picked a few off the top of my head that statistically are the biggest ones based on our past guests. If you want to see all the episodes with past guests and topic shows and all of that, because we do this twice a week, you can head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com and see all the episodes with the guest notes and pictures and and a ton more. If you head to whistlekick.com, you're going to find everything that we do because we do more than this show. We have products. And you can purchase those at 15% off with the code PODCAST15. But we also do a lot of other things. We're behind a lot of projects on the web, just trying to help grow the martial arts and spread the benefits of martial arts training. So go there, find out our other stuff, check it out, tell a friend. We've had a lot of wonderful guests on the show. But not every one of those guests has the legacy of training at the first school that Bruce Lee set up. But Sifu Abe Santos does. And in fact, that school recently closed down and he is carrying on the legacy himself. Now, of course, we talk about Bruce Lee. We talk about Bruce Lee's student who became his instructor. And we talk about a lot of things that are not Bruce Lee related. Sifu and I had, I thought, a wonderful conversation. Had a really good time with this one. And I think it comes through. We talk about his life, we talk about training, we talk about a lot of philosophy. And honestly, in hindsight, that makes sense. Someone training in Jeet Kune Do, being philosophical, yeah, that makes sense. So, let's check out this episode. Sifu Santos, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello, Jeremy. Uh, Thank you so much for inviting me on. I appreciate it very much. I appreciate you being here. Am I pronouncing your last name right? I should have done that before we started. (laughs) Yes, yes, Santos Santos. is fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Where, where, where the inflection goes on that A can vary a lot. Yes, Santos, yes, yes. Santos. Yes, it's usually just Santos. It's like pronounced Spanish. Yeah, that's that's kind of how I was, how I was reading it. But yeah, how are you? We were just chatting. Good. Of course, I'm sure the listeners know that you know we were we were talking for a few minutes yes. before we we got rolling here. You know, get, make sure technology's working and all that. Yes, yes, I'm doing very, very well. Good. Doing very, very well. It's uh, I'm in Seattle, and it's uh, it's a little sprinkly right now. But we we've for the past few days we've had like 80, 83 degree weather. So really? we've been fortunate. Yes, oh, that, that's unseasonal. And and listeners, of course, I was sharing with Sifu before the show that I woke up to snow this morning. So I I, I, I don't know if it's intentional. It feels like he's rubbing it in, <laughs> taking a jab. <laughs> well, it's at a little me. sprinkly now. It, it it's actually warm. It's it's warm. The sun's coming out, but it was sprinkling a little bit earlier. But I I, I believe it's going to get sunny a little bit this afternoon nice. on our way home. Awesome. You know, it's it's amazing how much weather impacts. I mean, the weather impacts, of course, you know, the, the climate and, and plants and, and animals and people's mood, but it can be so much more than that. I, I, I've talked a little bit on the show. My last career was in IT and we had a consulting firm. And if the weather was bad, computers broke more often because people were inside more often. You know, so there's something that you don't, you don't really think about, but when the weather was bad, our business was up. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. that. I guess that's true. If you're inside more, you're using the equipment more. Yeah. And, um, and basically tiring it out more. So that's why you're there repairing it. And then, of course, you know, here in New England, if we have, you know, an unseasonably nice day, you know, if it's, if it's early May or even April and it's a beautiful, beautiful day, martial arts classes are going to be very poorly attended. <laughs> That's what we found through the years is that it's funny because in the summertime, 
there would be less and less people coming the summer because everybody goes on vacations. It's difficult when class begins at a certain time and it's nice and suddenly you're with your family or you're out there in the park. It's difficult to force yourself to go to class and say, oh, I need to go to class. I mean, some people do it. But for the most part, I think uh, everybody usually tries to stay away and takes a break from it, I think. I think if it rains more, exactly right, I think people will be at class. Yeah. Yeah, because what's more fun to do inside than than martial arts? But of course, if you can be outside, as much as I love training outside, I mean, that's not the way most classes are formatted. Most schools don't have the opportunity to train outside. No, it's especially when it's really hot or it's, or it's raining, then it's, it's, it's easier to have it inside, especially if there's less, uh, uh, what do you call that, less um, people watching and less less. Uh, less distraction yeah. from uh, from people, and so that's so why we typically have it inside. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard enough to teach people, especially children, inside to take them outside and deal with the distractions of butterflies and birds and a dog running by. Is yes, is, uh, <laughs> it's a nightmare. It's very, very hard. It's very, very difficult and stuff. And How do you compete if with you a keep dog? it inside in a in, in a room in a in a box? You you finish what you have to do, and then and then and get done with that, and then you can go back outside. But, right. Uh, work hard while you're in there, no distractions, and then come out and then you can play again. That's right. That's right. Now, I introduced you as Sifu, so I'm going to assume that you are a practitioner of some manner of Chinese martial art. So can you tell me about that? Where where does that title sure. come from for you? Uh, the martial arts style system that I, that I um, uh, teach is, is called Jin Fan Jit Kune Do. And uh, Jun Fan, if everybody knows who Bruce Lee is, of course. Um, Jun Fan is is Chinese for Bruce Lee, and the Jeet Kune Do is in um, English is the way of the intercepting fist. So you can call it as Bruce Lee's way of the intercepting fist. And uh, my teacher was uh, Sifu Taki Kimura, which was um, um, is Bruce Lee's first assistant instructor in Seattle. When Bruce Lee first moved to Seattle in 1959, um, he started school, the, the Jin Fan Kung Fu Institute of Seattle, until he left in 1964. And Sifutaki, after uh, Sijo Bruce left, he continued to teach um, and and basically continued to teach and perpetuate what Bruce Lee taught him through a school. And we were at um, underneath his grocery store for, for many, many years. And uh, he owned a grocery store on First Hill uh, called the ShopRite. And basically, we worked out in the basement of the grocery store. So it was very simple. And um, in 2002, we moved to Woodenville to a barn. And we continued to teach in there. We could see Vitaki sold the grocery store in uh, 2001. And basically, we renovated the barn and we continued to teach there. And until until I left in 2000, at the end of 2017. So you're saying that the, the training space you were in up until 2001 is the same one that Bruce Lee started teaching in in, in 59? Well, well, when when Bruce Lee passed, when Bruce Lee was alive, he 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 and Bruce Lee passed away. Basically, he 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 wanted Steve Vitaki to to close the go to close the uh, the school. Okay. Uh, to shut the school down, basically, and then after when when Shiji Bruce passed away, Shivataki moved the school to underneath his basement oh, okay. because he he didn't um, because I think initially Bruce Lee wanted to have a lot of schools of martial arts, mm. right? I think as as years pass, I think he changed that philosophy and he decided that that instead of opening a bunch of schools, you wanted to kind of keep it as, as small as possible, quality versus quantity. And, and that's kind of the, the rationale that Sifutaki has kept all these years is where he, we basically taught like a private club where nobody knew at the basement of the grocery store when people would ask us if um, what we were doing because we would clean the parking lots every Monday evening and we would always tell people that we were in work release so, and then, and so people wouldn't ask questions. And, and if you go down to the basement of the store, you would know that there was a school there, but that was a school that uh, Sifutaki Kimura taught uh, Jin Fan Kung Fu for, and Jit Kune Do for many, many years um, until 2001. Wow. That, that's a long time to be in one space. 
Yes, yes. But he, it was a family grocery store that they owned. And since he owned the grocery store, he, um, he had that basement clear and open. And if, if anybody knows who Sifutaki is, they understand that Sifutaki, when Bruce Lee passed away, he never wanted to, people asked, he wanted uh, basically doing seminars or opening up a school and whatnot, but Sifutaki never wanted to do that. He just wanted to maintain it very small and continue to teach a small group of people um, out of respect to his best friend, Bruce Lee. Mm. And that's what he continued for all these years. He didn't do it for the money. He he basically didn't charge any dues. In fact, I remember when I first started in, in, in the 80s, um, there was no dues charged. And then in the 90s, maybe 1993, 1994, they started charging $2 a month. <laughs> and then it became $5 a month. And But that money didn't even go to, to anything. That money just went to... Uh, uh, keeping up the equipment that we had downstairs and also um, it also basically went into like a party, a summer party that we had every summer where a Sifu Roy Hollingsworth, which was another one of Bruce Lee's original students that taught class there would host a party at the basement and people from the school would come and attend the party every summer. So that's where that money went to was that. So it was, it was basically a private club. We Sifu Taki didn't collect any dues. He paid, the insurance that he had to pay for it, uh, out of his own pocket. And that's what we did for many, many years. So if it was that secretive, how did you find it in the 80s? Well, in 1983, I went to a, um, a Kung Fu demonstration. It was hosted by John Leon, which was the teacher for the Kung Fu Club of Seattle. And he held a martial arts demonstration every year. And one year, 1983, was held at Seattle Pacific University. And at the time, I was taking Shonru Karate uh, for a few years, and I wanted to attend that. So my mom and dad actually dropped me off there, and I attended that by myself. And I was, I was 13 years old, um, and uh, I, I 13, just turning 14, and I, I basically uh, watched it, and I sat on the bleachers. And in the, in the pamphlet, there was something that says, Taki Kimura, Bruce Lee's friend, Bruce Lee's best friend, something like that, with a photo of Sifutaki. And Sifutaki didn't do anything. He just basically got up, stood up, and they did do some, and he went back down. And, and as soon as I heard Bruce Lee, I wanted to find as much information about him because I, I was always a big fan of Bruce Lee. I've seen his movies. I watched Enter the Dragon at a big theater uh, around 1980 when it went on the theater. Mm. And... I, and I wanted to learn as much about Bruce Lee. And one of the first books I bought was, in fact, the first book I ever bought was the Tao of Jeet Kune Do when I was 10 years old. And I bought it at a uh, Wajamaya grocery store, a Japanese grocery store in Chinatown. And I still had that same book today with my notes and everything as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old writing, writing in there and looking at the pictures and reading it, but didn't understand what I was reading at the time. So I knew about Bruce Lee. And I used to buy posters and take the bus to Chinatown to buy Bruce Lee posters and watch all his movies. So as soon as I see I saw Sifutaki, someone who actually knew him in Seattle, I tried to find as much information about Taki Kimura. And he was in the white pages. And it's just a Taki Kimura with either an ad, I think it was just an address, uh, Ninth Avenue, and that's it. And basically, I, I wrote him a letter when I was 13. And he responded. And I met him, and uh, I met him at a different grocery store. It was a grocery store that he also owned. It was on Capitol Hill. And, and basically, I, I met him when I was just a young teenager, and he was, at, um, um, he was wearing a, uh, kind of a shirt and tie, and he had like a boardroom, and it was so formal when I first met him. But anybody who joined the Jin Fan Kung Fu Institute of Seattle always know that Sifutake always interviewed everybody that came in. He always asked you questions to make sure there was the right fit. And I remember he, he asked me questions and asked who I was, and and um, and and we talked, and 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 basically that's how I first met Sipataki, and that's how I first joined the Institute of uh, Jun Fang Kung Fu Institute of Seattle. I, I uh, the official time you can start was when you're 16 years old, so I couldn't really officially join, but I. At times, I would come and watch the class, and the classes were held on, on Monday evenings at 8 p.m. 
So I'd watch sometimes I'd come down and watch the class when I was a uh, teenager, but I, w I was very young though. So I couldn't really go there unless someone dropped me off there or, or picked me up. Um, I came and watched, and, but I couldn't really officially join until I was 16. But I remember visiting Sibutaki when, uh, before I can join, and even after, after that, and he'd come and he'd talk to me, and he, he'd spend, as busy as he was, he'd spend time with me to talk to me. And, and he, would, he would even show me techniques, tell me things to work on. And, uh, and after I joined, after I became 16, officially joined, I came to class, but I wasn't even as consistent coming to class because I became a teenage father when I was 17. So I, I, I basically was so busy with, with, with being a parent and working full time that, that although I tried to go to class, I wasn't consistent in class until a few years later. And, but Sifutaki, anytime I come and I'd visit him or call him, he'd always be open and he'd, he'd sometimes he'd call me back and ask me when I'm coming back. And that's the kind of person he was. And, um, that's how I first met him in 1983. And I've been with him since, since just until last year, uh, 2000, end of 2017. Hmm. Now, anybody that's been a parent at any point knows how difficult that is. I mean, it, it, it it's a challenge, right? But to be 17 and a parent and the fact that you didn't stop training, you didn't abandon it entirely. You were less consistent i mean that that says something about either your your time management skills I, I think it definitely says something about your time management skills but also your your passion for training which at that age i mean that there, there's something there there's something about why that was so important to you do you, can you can you talk about that i just really loved um the um martial arts I think um, when I was younger growing up, I, I didn't have that much confidence in myself. Um, I had kind of a speech impairment where I, anytime I had to, I'd be so nervous when um, I, in class, I'd have to read a section in a book and I, I would stammer and stutter because I was still nervous when people, when I had to talk a lot in front of people. Mm. And I think at that time, I, 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 when I was eight, nine years old, you know, my brothers and sisters got bullied in, in, um, while we were playing in the playground. That, that, that forced me to, to want to take Shoru Karate because I, I didn't want it. I felt so helpless. I was so scared. When you're eight years old, nine years old, you feel so hopeless and scared. And your brother and sister are getting beat up by bigger kids that you didn't want that to happen again. So that forced me to want to take uh, Karate. So I had my mom and dad signed me up in karate and I did that. And, and, but it, it, it's funny because it, 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 it became more than just, just, just me learning how to fight. I, I became more confident in myself that I wasn't as nervous in front of other people anymore. I wasn't as nervous to read, um, to read in front of class. I, I had a little more confidence and, and, and I think it showed to the way I carried myself even after after when I was became 10 or 11 or 12, I just had that, that kind of that confidence. And I think, and then after I joined the Jun Fan Kung Fu Institute of Seattle and met Sifutaki, I didn't want that to stop. I, I enjoyed myself while I was going there. And as, as difficult as it was when I was going to school, because I worked full time, I was working 30, 35 hours a week. One of my schedules when I was in school 18, when I was at, uh, I went to a school called Seattle, Seattle University was that, I, I kind of grew up when my daughter was born and when then she was born, that's when I realized I need to get my life straightened out. So I, I worked and my schedule was I'd work two o'clock in the morning to two to four and I delivered newspapers and it was when USA Today's first came out. So I delivered at different stores and I would deliver the Valley Daily uh, Journal news newspapers in front of people's houses and it was paper routes. And then at six o'clock in the morning, at five, five o'clock in the morning, I would, I would basically be, I was pobotomous. So I, I, I basically drew blood from babies. And then at eight, nine o'clock in the morning, I started school from nine, nine to like two o'clock to three o'clock. And that was my schedule until, and I did homework and whatnot. And I, I, I finally graduated. I, I, I graduated as an engineer. It took me a little while, but the, common thing the what i had during entire reach besides my family 
was the Jun Fan Kung Fu was Sifu Taki. If I didn't go to class because I was working and I had I, I was I was busy, Sifu Taki would call me to ask me when I'm coming back. Um, I, I enjoyed being at class, working out with the people that were there, and enjoyed enjoyed the camaraderie that we had of, of, of basically sparring with people when we had the chance to spar. Of basically going there and and f coming into class and feeling good about myself after I left and and. It's not you feel good while you're there because you're sweating, you're working hard, but you feel good when you're done. You feel confident, you feel feel healthy, you feel like you have something. I'm, I'm very a firm believer of you have to have something you're passionate about, something you really take, that you really enjoy in life. It doesn't have to be martial arts. It doesn't have to be, um, it, it could be anything. It could be art. It could be reading. It could be uh, tennis. It could be anything. But I feel like you need that something to make you feel good about yourself. So no matter how much hard work that you you were going through, how much tough times you were going through in life, you had that, that you can come back to that made you feel good, that made you feel whole and complete. And to me, the Jun Fen Jeet Kune Do, what, what I was there did that. It, it made me feel good about, it's what held me together during all my tough times when my, my um, daughter's um, mom and I didn't get along. And Sifutaki gave me some really great advice when that happened. And um, it gave me a lot of times when I was working really hard and, and going to school and, and, and working and, and going through all the st stress of being a, a, a parent at such a young age. And, and that, all that adversity, it was the Jin Fan Jikundo that got me through it. Hmm. What was it like learning martial arts in a school Founded by Bruce Lee, was there pressure there? I I um I didn't really feel the pressure okay. of anything there. I, I I don't at that age I didn't think I I fathomed how how what I was where I was at mm. because I was just a young kid. I was busy with all the other things that that, that I was doing. It wasn't until probably till um. 1993 there was the 20th anniversary of bruce bruce lee's death anniversary and i remember we went to the senior students in class we went to a, a dinner function at the house of hong and i remember at that function that was the first time where i actually saw some of the original students of bruce lee that came and visited seattle at that time you know i, I met people like um and people that lived here like jesse glover skip ellsworth i remember talking to him for a little while um, and other people like Sunny Umpad, um, who was a Filipino practitioner in Visayan martial arts, and Ted Wong. These people came here in 1993, and they talked about Bruce Lee, what uh, celebrating his his life. And then in 1996, we had the uh, first Jun Fan Jikundo nucleus meeting in January 1996 that was held in Seattle, and you had all the original students of Bruce Lee, uh, not all of them, but a, a lot of them. You had people like Danny Nasanto, Ted Wong, um, George Lee, um, Alan Joe, Larry Hartzell, Richard Bristillo, people, uh, Dan Lee, people like that, and Herb Jackson, Bob Bremer, Pete Jacobs, they were all, Linda and Shannon were there, of course, and of course, Sifutaki. And and it was just an amazing feeling right there to say, hey, wow, we are really an important part of the Jin Fan, of the Jeet Kune Do, of Bruce Lee's legacy, because we are where it all began, Bruce Lee's first school. So that right there hit me right there saying how important the Seattle era of the Jin Fan Jeet Kune Do is in terms of the whole um, realm of of the Jeet Kune Do legacy, the Jin Fan of Bruce's legacy, how important we really were. I mean, he's buried in Seattle. Yeah. And, and because Seattle was his favorite place to be at, that's where he felt most at home. And, and it was just amazing. That's when I realized how important, how lucky I am to be part of, of the Jin Fan Kung Fu Institute, uh, to be, to have met Sifu Take so many years ago, to know him through all these years, to be part of it. That's where we felt, I felt very, very lucky and very fortunate. Hmm. Sounds like an, an honor. I mean, not, not just the style, but the legacy. You know, one of the things that 
a lot of people resonate with in the martial arts seems to be that connection to legacy. I think that's why so many people push lineage and, and make it so important. You know, so-and-so taught so-and-so, and I learned from them. But I don't think anybody can argue that to be two degrees, two degrees of separation from Bruce Lee's instruction. Pretty powerful. I feel very, very lucky, very happy because to think that I wrote Sifu a letter when I was only 13 or 14 years old and, 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 and he responded to that letter and I contacted him and, and here I am today, 2019. And it's, it's just an amazing fact because if you think about it from 2000, uh, uh, when, when we had the first annual Jeet Kune Do Nucleus meeting it was 1996, Bruce Lee passed away in 1973. Now it's 2019. So there's a 24, 23 year separation between that time period and now this time period. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about it the other day and I, and I feel like I feel really old because I was like those students, the original students of Bruce Lee that were there 23 years later, they all met in Seattle. Here I am 23 years later, still in Seattle. And most of those original students of Bruce Lee have all gone. They're all passed away. Yeah. So I feel very fortunate to be here still with Sifataki, um, to have met a lot of them through the years, to, to know them and to talk to them about Bruce Lee, to, to be associated to this. I feel very honored to be part of this, this, this legacy. And, and I think one of the reasons why I wanted to start the school, because when I first, 22 years ago, I, I, I didn't think about opening up a school. I, there was really nothing that, that interested me in opening up a school. I just wanted to work out, continue to learn, be with Sifutaki, and that was it. But it was, it, it was years later, like maybe when, when I, we did our first seminar in France in 2012, 2013, and I met people that, I'm, I'm telling you, Jeremy, that met people that basically were crying to me how honored they feel to have us come there to teach them. How they felt like they were closer to Bruce Lee than any time in their life. Um, I have a student in France, just I saw earlier this year that, that last year when I first saw him, he told me that he idolized Bruce Lee for all these years and he never, never felt close to Bruce Lee until he went to my first seminar last year. Because I, I was so close because I'm, I'm learning from Taki Kimura, which was Bruce Lee's best friend and Bruce Lee's highest ranked student. I'm, I'm friends with, with Sifu Taki, I'm friends with Linda Lee. And, and I've been part of this for such a long time. They, they felt so close to it. And, and, and these people can never go to Seattle. They can never visit, visit United States. It's difficult for them to, it's very expensive. It's hard to get a visa. So I felt, I felt like, so lucky that that I'm part of this that that I felt obligated to kind of help perpetuate the legacy by going there to help teach them and and don't teach them for the money or or anything like that it, it basically just teach people who are interested in learning Bruce Lee's original art and not for any ranks not for any certificates but just learning to be closer to Bruce Lee in that way and, and I'm happy to teach people like that. And that's why I do what I do is, and why I opened the school is, is we want to continue what Sifu Taki started through us where our school is nonprofit. We don't charge, I don't get paid to teach. I do it out of passion of my, um, the, my passion to perpetuate Sifu Taki's legacy and Bruce's legacy. And that's why we continue to do this, to continue what he started. Mm. Good stuff. Now, it's hard to talk about Jeet Kune Do without Bruce Lee. It's hard to talk about Bruce Lee as a martial artist without Jeet Kune Do. A lot of martial artists read his writings as um, in an attempt to understand his martial arts philosophies. I'm going to assume you've read the same books? I've read many books. Okay. I, I don't read too many books anymore, but right. I've read many books in the past what and heard many things. What I'm curious of, because 
the majority of us who read those books like to think that we understand what he was saying, what his intent was, what Jeet Kune Do was all about. But of course, spending decades training in a martial arts style in a system is going to give you far more indication of what was really going on, assuming that it hasn't been changed too much. And, and, and I'm going to doubt that it was with the, the reverence that you're speaking of and that your Sifu, I, I'm assuming, instilled in you that reverence for Bruce Lee. So what I'm curious of is, is our understanding, you know, the wider martial arts community, is our understanding of Bruce Lee and of Jeet Kune Do based on these books, is it accurate? I think everybody has their own opinion and their own interpretation mm. of what Jeet Kune Do is. Um, I think you, 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 you have to understand that Jeet Kune Do is, is more than a martial arts. It's, it's a way of thinking, a way of thought. It's a, it's a way of life. And, and Jeet Kune Do is, if you define it in the martial arts, Jeet Kune Do in, in Chinese is the way of the intercepting fist. The core, if, if you speak in relative terms of just in martial arts itself, the core of Jeet Kune Do, what Bruce Lee trained in his official training was in Wing Chun Kung Fu when he, when he was 13, until he was 18. So we had five years of training in the Wing Chun. So the core of what he started, Jin Fang Kung Fu, he started, was the Wing Chun Kung Fu. But as he progressed through the years, and and as he as he learned judo, he learned judo here in Seattle with um, with um, with many people here. Uh, one of the people that he that he learned with was uh, Fred Sato. Fred Sato was a Japanese. He was an Olympic uh, Olympic judo black belt, and he learned judo from him, and he learned different other styles, and he, and he read a lot of books on martial arts, and he 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 used and he combined what was useful and and what worked for him what worked for his particular body style and and as he left seattle he went to san francisco to oakland and he started school there and he fought wong jack man that in that movie birth of the dragon where he found out that that the wing chun had limitations because he couldn't chase people down with that because the wing chun if you remember wing chun was started by a woman and the style of the Wing Chun is you come to me. It's a, it's not a, it's not an approach where you attack. It's more like, more like you come and, and it's more like a, a defensive measure where you come and you attack me and then I respond, counter. And Bruce Lee, he evolved. He changed what he was doing because he added later on when he went to LA, he, he met people that were much bigger than him. People like uh, Lou uh, Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, people like Larry Hartzell, people like Bob Remmer, that he couldn't do certain things with them. So he had to adapt, he had to change. Instead of doing more of the chi style, for example, he did in Seattle, he did more of the footwork. He added fencing, he added boxing. And, and he adapted his style to fit at the time, to fit what he wanted to work on at that time period. Does that make sense? It does. And so he... He adapted himself during that time. He made himself better each time. But the core of what it is is still the Wing Chun Kung Fu because I've seen letters from Sivataki that Bruce Lee wrote Sivataki. And in those letters, he, and Sivataki would get letters and, and would call, um, get calls from Bruce and say, Taki, I don't want you to do this anymore because Wing Chun isn't all, all. It's still important. But you, when you face bigger people, you have to do something like this. So at that time when he moved to Oakland or, or to LA, he focused less on the on the chi sao and focused more on the mobility, for example, the boxing. It doesn't mean the stuff he he taught in Seattle or Oakland wasn't important. It just meant that at that time with the people, the kind of students he had, he adapted and he and he did what he wanted to work on to fit that individual, to fit what worked at that time period. But the core of everything that still comes in is still from the South period, still from, and even sooner than that, from the Wing Chun. And I think that when Bruce Lee went to Seattle, he went to Seattle twice a year and he visited, because they visited Linda's mom, because Linda's mom still lived here. And he wrote Sivataki letters all the time telling him what he was, 
up to speed on in Oakland and LA and told Chief Taki, I want you to work on this. I want you to work on, on this more. And then when I come to Seattle, I'm going to show this to you. And that's what, what Bruce Lee did to Sivitaki. He always kept him in the loop about what he was doing in respect to the Jeet Kune Do. But it was Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. It's what worked for him. It's what, what, it was what Bruce Lee's expression of the Jin Fan Gung Fu. The Jin Fan Gung Fu, the basics and the core, is still, a lot of it's still the Wing Chun. But his expression... And what he added afterwards with the boxing, with the fencing, with the savat, with the judo, all those things became Bruce Lee's expression of the Jeet Kune Do. So that was Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. It's Bruce Lee's way of the intercepting fist. But if, even if the name, if you think about it, a lot, of, a lot of the, even the name, Wing Chun has a lot of countering and has a lot of interception techniques. Even the name goes back to the Wing Chun. Mm. So people have this conception that, um, that Bruce Lee took away all the Wing Chun. That's not true. He, he still felt that that was important. It just wasn't what he was teaching primarily at the time. And you still have to have the core of the Jin Fan Gung Fu. That's all that things, the kicks and the punches and everything. That's still the Jin Fan Gung Fu. But your expression of that, the core is the Jeet Kune Do. When, when the... Nucleus formed in 1996, January 10th, 1996, and we had the meeting in Seattle. And I, I was fortunate to be part of that, to, to be there at that time. And um, even have a video of that still that sometimes I look at once in a while. And it was formed because there was people teaching this, people teaching that. There wasn't any consistency. There was people that were, that, that attended a few seminars, but were, um, but didn't really understand the art. I mean, I remember in 1993, I went to Denver for work. And I remember I, I looked at the yellow pages and I looked at martial arts, as I always do every city I go to. And I saw Jeet Kune Do in big letters. But I called that number and I, and, and, and I said, can I come and watch? Because I was working and, 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 and I was just at the hotel. And, and at first the person said, oh, um, you know, we don't allow visitors to watch but then he asked me where I was from I told him I was from Seattle and he asked me if I trained I said yeah, I want to see if we talk to students and certain enough he, he came and picked me up <laughs> 20 miles away and I watched his class and at the end I saw his class and he asked me uh, uh, or he I asked him so where did you learn from he said I attended a few seminars here and there and then I was watching his techniques and and then Afterwards, some of the students came and asked me afterwards and said, oh, can you come and, sh and show us something? So I, so I showed them a few things. And they came at the end, of, you know, when, when the instructor wasn't there. And he said to me, oh, we should have you teach class. <laughs> but, but what happens is that you have a watered-down version of the Jeet Kune Do, Bruce's Jeet Kune Do, Because people who are, who are learning this, learning that, and, and they're com com they don't really understand the full art of the Jeet Kune Do. So they're teaching a watered-down version. It's, it's like, for example, um, someone teaches one thing but only touches the surface of it, 30% of it. They don't really understand it because they're learning a different technique all of a sudden without really fully understanding that first technique. Then all of a sudden they open up school after a year, two years. Basically, they're teaching that person that they learned 30% of the original technique from the source. Let's say Bruce Lee. They're only learning 30% of what he knows. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's a watered out version and people are learning all these different systems and combining them together. And they're thinking that's Jeet Kune Do. But Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do was not that. It, 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 from one of the rules that we had in school in the Jin Fan Gung Fu Institute before was that if you learned from us, you only stuck with us and you didn't learn anything else. And there was a reason for it. And I didn't realize that till later. And the reason why is because to really fully understand an art, a technique, you have to really learn it. If you're trying to learn this and that and this and that, what happens as a beginner is that you learn, you think that you're combining the different techniques together without even knowing it because you don't really understand it. So what happens is that, and then you, and then you come out of class and you start thinking that's what you learned, but that's not really what you were taught. That's what you think you were taught but that's what you learn. And that's the problem with now is that 
and they call it Jeet Kune Do, but it's their Jeet Kune Do. It's their own interpretation of the of that art, but it's not Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. And that's what, as long as you, as long as they understand that, that it's not no longer Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do, once you start adding all these different things to it, once you start putting your own tweaks to it, it's no longer Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do, it's your own self-expression. One of the things that came out of that nucleus, um, uh, nucleus meeting was that they wanted all the different schools from Oakland, Seattle, and LA to teach the same Jin Fan Kung Fu, meaning to teach the same techniques throughout each of the schools. So there was a consistency. So everybody was taught the basics, the same thing, no matter what school you were. I have a copy of the original curriculum from LA, Seattle, and Oakland. And believe me, they're very, very similar. And, but now what happens is that when you start putting money involved and you start adding, trying to make money and you start doing this and that, and you start changing it to get people excited about things. To say, oh, I learned so much, I learned this, I learned this. But you lose the simplicity of the art. You learned the originality of what Bruce was trying to portray, or trying to teach. And it's not to say it's wrong, but you lose the core of what Bruce was trying to do. And I think one of the things that I've been fortunate enough to be Sifataki's student for such a long time is that he kind of told me all this for many, many years and that he understood the totality of the art of what Bruce was trying to go from here to there. And, and what he taught at the Jeet Kune Do level in, in Seattle was that he taught what Bruce Lee actually taught him. He didn't change it. He didn't add something else to it. He didn't add his own techniques to it or, or a different martial art that he learned to it. He kept it as pure as what Bruce Lee taught him as, he, as, as Bruce Lee taught him 20 years, 30, 40 years later. And what Bruce Lee taught him, not only what he taught him when he was in Seattle, but we also taught him when he came back to Seattle twice a year. So that's why Steve Taki said he understand what Bruce Lee was trying to go in terms of totality of the art of the Jin Fan Jeet Jeet Kune Do. And because he kept it as pure as possible. And the reason why he can keep it as pure as possible is because he, he didn't do it for the money. He, can, he wasn't trying to keep students. He was trying to basically just teach Bruce Lee's art the way Bruce Lee taught him. And that's why it, at the original school that we had, the Jin Fen, a lot of people left. They didn't stay consistently for, they left after two, three years because they got tired of why are we doing the same thing over again? Or why are we, we, we doing this? Or why, why are we doing all the advanced techniques that the next group is doing? It was a way for us to filter out, to weed out the people who weren't serious about learning Bruce Lee's art. It was, People would just want to learn really fast. Good things take time, and and you have to learn the core and the basics of the technique to really fully understand it, to really be able to teach it. You have to understand that. You can't rush into it. You can't run before you can know how to walk. Mm. So it, everything's a step. And in Seattle, Shifutaki was able to do it, teach it the way he wanted to teach it because he didn't have to, he wasn't trying to keep students it was a private club we didn't do it for the money he just basically taught exactly the way bruce Lee wanted to teach it when we talk about any martial artist there are obviously a lot of influences and you've spoken very highly of, of your sifu sifutaki through our conversation today and of course you know bruce lee's influence on you can't be argued but if there was somebody else that we could name you know, if we were to take those two people off the list, who would you say has been really influential for you? I think I'd probably say my mom. Hmm. And the reason why I say that is because my mom is the one in, in the, in the Shorten room. I think she's the one that drove me at class twice, uh, twice a week to take me to class. She was the one that made my mom, my dad drive me to the Seattle Pacific university, uh, um, to, to watch the first martial arts demonstration um, just when I first saw Sibutaki. And she was the one that basically supported me through the years and, 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 and driving me to the Shoran Karate and also even sometimes driving me to Seattle, you know, going with her to Seattle when she was working to, to, to allow me to even take the bus to visit Sibutaki when I was a teenager. 
And she did that. And she supported me through all the years and, and still supports me to, to this day to, to what I'm trying to do, which is just perpetuate um, Bruce Lee's legacy as much as possible and, and see Vitaki's legacy as much as possible. So I'd probably say my mom in, in that sense. Because without her support, I wouldn't be here right now. Did she understand how important martial arts was to you at, as a kid? I think she did. I think that's why she drove me. She drove me there twice a week hmm. uh, to the Shorn Ru, and uh, she didn't drive that much, but she was willing to drive me, and no complaints. She drove me every uh, every Tuesday or Thursday or something like that, and picked me up two hours later, and and took me to class, and it was like that for four or five years until I um, until I basically went to the Jun Feng Kung Fu. Now, if you could train with anyone that you haven't, and, and again, I want to take Bruce Lee off the table here because that seems like an obvious answer. We're trying to get into some new stuff. If you could train with anybody, anywhere in the world, any style, alive or dead, who would you want to train with? I would probably want to train, and you take Bruce Lee off the table, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I would probably say there. There's. I, I, I'm trying to recall the name of, of, of. There, there's a famous Japanese swordsman, Miyamoto or, Musashi. Or, um, uh, Musashi, yes, Musashi, yeah. and 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 you hear about all the all the stories about him, how great of a samurai he was, and what what he did. I'm. I like to follow him around and learn from him, because I I, I I I like samurai movies very much, and I enjoy the samurai flicks that that you see um, like Lone Wolf and the Cub series or like, mm. um, uh, the Blind Swordsman, Zato Ichi. And, and uh, so I really enjoyed the, the kind of the samurai aspect and the way the samurais, the way they, um, their way of life and also the way they trained and also uh, to see how he was as a skilled swordsman because you hear the stories about the samurai and I've, they're very, very skilled swordsmen. So to see that in person, I think that would be a great great thing to do mm. yeah and certainly not an uncommon answer on the show but i want to i want to dig into something you you used a word a specific word that i found interesting you'd like to follow him around and when you talked about your start with jeet Kune Do, you were observing so mm -hmm. i'm curious if if that word choice has anything to do with your notion of education especially martial arts education I think, I think it's very important, I think, to, to watch, to, to observe, and, and, then, and then to learn from them as much as possible. But, but, to, to, but to do it in a way where they, they, they teach you freely that they're themselves, that they're not teaching you or are or, or doing this where it, it's forced. I, I want to see them in their natural um, state basically, and and to see what they are as a person and individual, and I think you see, it's not just martial arts. Is it just, just learning how to fight or learning how to, um, to move a sword or learning how to punch? I think martial arts is more important. I think, it, it, like the Jin Fan and the, the Jeet Kune Do, it, it's 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 kind of a way of life in a sense. It's it's. And first, it, it becomes physical. You want to learn how to fight. You want to, learn to protect yourself. But in a certain time, it becomes kind of mental in a way. It, it becomes, you, you just reach that point where you're, you're confident in yourself, where you, you walk and, and, and you have pride in what you do. You want to be the best in what you can do, no matter what it is, to do your best, to be aware of your surroundings, to, to kind of learn as much as possible. And I think that way of life, that, that way of basically a, a, a way that you can take from martial arts to your to life in general, I think that's very, very important because these people like Musashi and, and we're not, they weren't just people that just did martial arts and then that was done. That, that was who they were. That was their very being. That was, that's what made them who they were. The martial arts isn't what defined them. It's what made them to where they were. It was part of their journey. But to see them in their natural state, to see them fully, I think that would be a great thing. The world has certainly changed from 
from that time, from the time of the samurai and, and the need for martial arts on a physical level, on a self-defense level. People make different arguments. I, I would say it's it's lessened. But I think we can make argument for the other aspects of martial arts, maybe even being more important today. As you've started your own school, how do you reconcile the differences or or, or how do you teach not just the physical aspects of martial arts, but how do you make sure that you're working with people on the philosophy, the personal growth, the understanding of themselves? How do you balance all that? I think when, when you have a student and the student, and similar to what Sifu Taki has done in the past, where he, he screened people who, who wanted to join, I, I do the same as well. I see what they're interested in, where where they want to go in this. If they want to, basically, I get emails. Oh, I want to, uh, I I want to be in movies, or I want to be a, I want to open up school. I want to teach teach this, and and after a few years, and and get a rank here. But I have to put them down to earth and tell them that that's not what we're about. If you want to learn real martial arts, and you want to learn from us. We, we don't, and similar to what Sivitaki told me many, many years ago, is we teach you how to become better people. Not, not I, I tell them first, first off the bat, we're not here to teach you how to fight. We're, we teach you how to become better individuals because I think as people become, and they basically understand that, and they understand that they're, we're not going to go and, and try to put them on a routine where they're, after one year, they, they can go and, beat everybody up or they open up a school. That's not what we're about. And that's not what we, we're upfront with people like that. We tell them that, that, that we, that this is a process. This is about learning it, it about learning the technique to fully understand it, to, to, to have patience, to teach you patience, to teach you how, how after you understand the technique and you learn the technique and you know how to fully apply it, and you know how to express it in, in combat, express it, without I even had to think about it. And and with that, as you learn more techniques, you become confident in yourself. You become confident in your ability where you don't have to show off. You don't have to tell people, oh, I take martial arts. You don't have to, if, if someone basically is, is, is making um, obscene gestures at you or calling you names, you can walk away from it and you can just smile at them and say, I'm sorry. I'm just going to go on my way because martial arts is, it's your words. It's using your, your mind. That's real martial arts. It's not the physical. In the beginning, it's physical, but as you progress and you become more confident in yourself, it automatically becomes mental where you don't have to prove yourself. You're not this spirited young brash kid that has to prove yourself to everybody who challenges you anymore. You're in a sense now, where you basically, you don't have to prove yourself because you're confident in your ability that, that you can do exactly what you need to do and that's it, and walk away from it. Or words, even if it's the worst words that people say to you, you can just brush it off you because it's nothing, it's just words. And, and in that sense, you, you have confidence and, and you can take that outside of martial arts, you can take that in your life where you stress, where in martial arts you're training to become really good at it, well, you can bring that to outside of that, to anything that you do in life, to be the best you can be, to have confidence in yourself that you're just as good as anybody else, as long as you work hard at it, because it's not easy. It's, it's work. You don't have to compete with anybody else but yourself to be the best you can be. And we lay that out for people in the beginning. We tell them that go your own pace, do the best you can. That is the most important thing. And they learn as they get confident in their abilities they learn to use that same philosophy elsewhere in life where they do the best they can in anything that they do and have confidence in doing it. Well said. Now you brought up enter the dragon earlier in our conversation. And I like to ask guests about movies and, and TV and the, the martial arts kind of pop culture stuff that they enjoy. Are, do you, do you still watch martial arts TV movies? Oh yes, I do. Okay. Do you have favorites? Um, 
Dave, besides Inner Dragon and the Chinese Connection, I, I watch a lot of Jet Li movies. Um, I watch um, uh, one of my favorite movies is called The Raid. Yeah. It's uh, with an Indonesian actor. Uh, I think his name is Ikoi Weiss. Yep. Yeah, we've talked about that movie on this show quite a bit. Okay, yeah, it's one of my favorite movies. And then I always watch the movies that come out in theater, like the movies with Jason Statham that comes out. Um, so whenever there's a martial arts movie, I try to try to see if it's if it's if it's any good. Cool. What future plans do you have? You know, what where do you what are you working towards? Um, I think. Well, we, we still have the, the Jin Fan Kung Fu Academy where after so many years with Sifutaki, we, we decided to leave, uh, to go on our own path. I think um, the academy was started on the same context of trying to start a, a school where we didn't do it for money, where we weren't paid to teach, where we basically went ahead and, and, and taught for the purity of the art and try to teach Bruce Lee's art what Sifu Taki learned from him, and we pass off to to students who are interested in learning. So we, we tried to do that in that sense with the academy. And so we opened up um, last year in 2000, early 2018, we we opened it up and we're in the Chinatown area. And then also I, I, I do uh, a few seminars a year. I, I You know, I have a regular job at any day, so I, I don't do it for the money, but I, I what I try to do is, is the people that I've met in the past that were so interested in learning um, Bruce Lee's art and Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee's Jin Fan Kung Fu is, is I want to come back and still teach them because they're, they're so passionate about learning. And it's good to keep that. I mean, you're never going to learn how to a really a martial art by just going to seminars. That's, that's not the case. But most times people can't do that. They 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 can't they can't stay with one teacher like I have for thirty five years. It, it's it's just not possible. It, it's it's unreal now in these days now where you can have that. But I was fortunate to be with Shivataki for just a long time, and I want to kind of to give back um, at the institute, the Jin Fan Kung Fu Institute of Seattle. When we moved to the barn after two thousand two, I taught the Wednesday night classes from two thousand two to to basically 2017. And it was Wednesday nights at 8 p.m., uh, 8 to 10 p.m. And I I basically, um, we didn't do it for the money. I didn't do it to um, uh, to get paid for that. It was, we were there to start to help Sifutaki out so he wouldn't have to teach because Sifutaki would still be trying to teach if, if I wasn't there. And um, so I, I would be there to help, to, to basically teach a class so he wouldn't have to. So. Shivataki would sit there and watch class, but if he saw something he didn't like or he saw some people were not doing it correctly, he would have them do it over and over and over again. And that's just the way it was, I mean, in class. And Shivataki is no longer with with me at the academy, but, you know, he's 95 years old now. <laughs> but we want to continue the class as much as, like, he was still there. Like, like I can hear his voice in the background telling Abe, these guys aren't doing this right. Abe, don't don't do this right. It's funny. I remember at a demonstration in Chinatown that we had maybe five years ago. It was July. It was it was really hot. It was like in the eighties or something. And it was the demonstration was um, was held like at six o'clock at night on a Saturday. And there was a few of us in in, in the cl class that came and did the demo. And I remember I was talking in in the microphone and Sifutaki was behind me and these guys were behind me as well doing the demo. And I remember Sifutaki was saying, Abe, whispering in my ear, Abe, these guys aren't doing it right. And I was like, can you have them continue doing the kicks? So, and I didn't realize, and I was looking at the audience, I looked back and a lot of these guys were, were like so strained because they were doing like, like 300 kicks already of side kicks or front kicks and they were so tired and they're moving to the left leg and they're getting, they look really sloppy because of fatigue. So I had to move them to a, I had to say, stop it, you know, say, go on to something else. But that's the way Sifutaki was. Sifutaki was a perfectionist. If you weren't doing something correctly, even if it was a demo, he wants you to do it again and again and again and again until you got it right. And he, that was his philosophy. And that's the kind of philosophy we keep. That's the way I teach. 
at the school. That's why one of Sivataki's other longtime students that I started the academy with, Michael Hilo, he's there with me. And that's the way we teach class. And, and even though we aren't part of the institute anymore, we teach it like we were still part of the institute because we were the ones teaching all those years. So in a sense, we were kind of in a, kind of extended that to what we have now at the academy. Hmm. Sounds, sounds great. You know, anybody that's moved on and, and started their own school knows how exhilarating it can be. What's your, what's been your favorite part so far? I think my favorite part is just, it just talking to the people, uh, meeting the people that are there that are interested in learning then and watching them grow. I mean, we've only been operating. We just celebrated our one year anniversary in March and, uh, to, to see their growth from when they first did the technique nine, 10 months ago, 11 months ago, to where they do now, you can see the, the growth of where they have. And, and to see that growth and see the, the, the glimmer in their eye when they, when they see how good that, when I give them a compliment that they're doing much better, it, 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 it gives you kind of a, a good feeling that you're helping them along. You know, one of the people there in class says that when she feels, when she goes to class um, uh, and she's a woman, she said she feels strong. She feels strong outside of class. She feels uh, uh, empowered. And that's a good feeling to have is, is to, that's that confidence that you install in people because they feel good when they're in class and they come out of class. So I think doing that, kind of helping them along in their life, helping along their path into the martial arts and learning Bruce Lee's art as close to what Bruce Lee was, was teaching when he was still alive. I think it's a, it's a great thing. And, and I think it's a good thing because that's what Sifutaki would, that's what Sifutaki had wanted us to do. And I, I, like I said, years ago, 20 years ago, I had no thought about opening up a school, but it was these past seven, eight years where people were asking me what's going to happen when the, when Sifutaki is, can no longer be there. What are you going to do? What's going to happen to Jun Fan Gung Fun Seattle? And I tell them, well, I don't know. It's, it's supposed to be his son that's going to take over. But a lot of these people have told me, how come you don't do it? How come you're not opening up? How come you're not doing a seminar, continue to do a seminar? Because it's, it's important for you because you, you've been with Sifutaki for such a long time. And you know, him, you know him so well. And, and you learn from him that if you don't teach what you know, then what you know dies with you. And that, that made me realize that I have to share some of my knowledge that I learned from Sivataki because if not, it's, 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 it's not going to go anywhere. I, I'm not doing my part to perpetuate Bruce's legacy if that was the case. Hmm. And that's why we were continuing to what we're doing here is, is, is me and, and Michael Hilo to continue to teach what Sifutaki taught us. If people want to find you online, you know, website, social media, things like that, where can they go? Uh, we have a Facebook page. We have the Jin Fan Kung Fu Academy. Uh, we have Instagram, the Jin Fan Kung Fu Academy. We, we have a, we're working on our own website, but we have a general website for the Jin Fan Kung Fu Seattle. Um, uh, that was part of the school for, for very many years, but that's, and then if anybody wants to contact me, uh, email me directly. It's at Jin Fan Kung Fu Academy at gmail.com. But we're, we're available. We're, we're around and, and we're in Seattle and, and we, we, we don't advertise for students at all. Uh, we're, we're kind of, kind of a private club as well. And, and if you go outside our class, you don't even know that there's a school there. It's, it's just, basically just word of mouth It's exactly the way the school was started years ago. It's just word of mouth and, and, and you have to be recommended by somebody to come and we, and if not, we interview, we talk to you and see if there's a right fit. And, yeah. but you, you have to be willing to learn and to learn it the proper way and, and not, not the fast way, but learn it properly to fully understand the art. Wonderful. I really appreciated talking with you today. And as we wind down here, you know, our standard parting question. What advice would you give to the people listening today? I think I would tell people that if you really want to learn martial arts or Jin Fan Jit Kundor or anything, then, then can, can, it's never too late. 
you can do, uh, you can still learn. And, and as long as you understand that good things take time to be patient and, and it's not learning so many things all at once. It's trying to be good at one thing first before you start turning so many things. That's where you can really understand to go deep into the art, to understand the art completely, to fully explain it and how you can apply it in a real combat or real life. And I think that's very, very important. I think because if not, you are just only skimming the surface. And what happens is that many, many teachers, they, they do a technique, but if you really watch them closely, they're not doing the technique correctly. But you, you have to have kind of a, you have to be kind of experienced to see that. But it looks like the same thing, but it really isn't. And, and Sifutaki was so good at that. He can, he can look at something and say, oh, they're not doing it right, Abe. They're not doing this. And, and, and that's because, they, that's because they, they didn't really understand the technique or they didn't really understand art before they, they did something else. They kind of wanted to do so many things because it's, it's, it's nice, it's, it's exciting, you know. And, 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 and the rule of thumb these days now is, is learn as much as you can and, and do as much as you can. And, but the problem is that you, you don't learn it each one really well. And, and one of the things that Bruce Lee did, always said, is that quality versus quantity. Do it correctly, understand it. So you don't have to think, you just do. Your hands, your feet just moves by itself. You just feel. And, and, and that's important. It can, when we practice the chi sao, which is a sensitive exercise in class, I tell all the students is that once you get to that point, you, you, don't even, you don't think, you feel your hands move by itself. And you don't even know that your hands, by the time everything's done, the guy's on the ground because your hand moved by itself. You don't even know what happened because your body just moves on its own. And that's the kind of mentality, that's, that's where you want to be at, is to be patient, learn the technique correctly. Don't be in a hurry. You, you have to be able to, to, um, to crawl, to walk, before you start, start running. Because I, I think, but it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be martial arts. It could be, it could be anything in life. You know, I think whatever give, makes you feel good about yourself, that's, that is the most important thing. It doesn't have to be martial arts. But for me, martial arts was just the thing that I enjoyed. And the, the Jin Fan Jeet Kune Do and, and being fortunate to be a student of Sivataki for such a long time and, and, and for so many years that, that a, a lot of people, you, it, this doesn't happen these days anymore. A lot of people leave and they, they don't come back because they want to do something else. They get busy with life. But, but for me, I just love to be there. I love, and, and I always said that um, as long as Sivataki is still here in class, I'll always be with him. And that's, that's exactly what I've done is, is be with him as long as I can. So I think that's, that's important is, is find something that you enjoy, uh, passionate about, and do it because it's never too late. Because that's it's the mental aspects, not the physical. It's the mental that makes a difference in your life that you can apply everywhere else in your life. One of the things we've talked about on this show quite a bit is the notion of the right way and the wrong way. And I feel pretty strongly that there's no right way or wrong way. There are just differences. And what I really liked about our conversation today was that Sifu Santos talked about not the right way, but Bruce Lee's way. And you train and you make it your way and his way and this way. And what I like about that is that it pays homage to lineage. It expresses the importance of knowing where you've come from, but also recognizes that you have to follow your own path and do your own thing. And when I look at this episode in that way, that comes up quite a few times. The notion that Sifu is very reverent of his instructor, Sifu Taki. You mentioned him by name quite a few times, but also talked about certain elements of him and his own training. And I think it strikes a good balance. And I think it's a good lesson for the rest of us. Sifu, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for your time. And I hope to talk to you soon. You should head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes. This is episode 406. And you can see photos and links. We talked about social media and websites. And you can find links to all that there. And you can find all of our other episodes. Sign up for the newsletter so you know what's going on. We've been rolling out some original content in the newsletter, stuff you're not going to find elsewhere. 
And of course, whistlekick.com is our digital hub for everything that we've got going on for all of our projects and products. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 gets you 15% off there. If you want to follow us on social media, and you should, we are at Whistlekick everywhere you can think of. And my personal email address is jeremy at whistlekick.com. I love feedback, and I'd love to hear from all of you. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.